Hi, uh, um, a question for Keeley. Um, so, <laughs> um, Henry's progress in 1541 was more or less in response to the Pilgrimage of Grace, correct? Arguably, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Depends on which historian you're asking. Yeah. So prior to that, were pilgrimages up to the north of England not all that common? Uh, no. So the furthest north Henry had been was to Warwick in 1511. And then he kind of was very much a sort of London commuter. Um, I think uh, Hoyland Ramsdale wrote that he, you know, the north of England was terra um, ignota to Henry. So he didn't really... I don't want to say he didn't care because that's not true, um, but I don't think he saw the value in traveling so, so extensively until sort of later in his reign. But I think um, I think it was Sam who said, uh, you know, the, oh, it wasn't, um, someone earlier <laughs> just said um, that the Tudor government was very much patching leaks as they appeared. Uh, you can kind of see the progress is kind of functioning in that way a little, uh, especially when you consider the sort of northern progress in 1541. Thank you for three really great papers. Um, my question is for Oscar. I was wondering if you could um, speak maybe a bit more about um, the institutions and the spaces situated around the Chapel Royal, um, like what's going on in the physical space around the Chapel Royal. So, in, and sort of in terms of where the Chapel Royal is in, in palaces or? Yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah. Um, there was a very, very good lunchtime lecture uh, made here <laughs> at the site of antiquaries um, by Morris Howard and chapel royals are in that sort of placed at the end of a procession um, and sort of architectural procession almost where um, whereby sort of you know the monarch can make a procession from the royal apartments through the presence chamber through uh, sort of you know various very sort of visual corridors um, up to the chapel. Um, the Actual sort of, so, so on holy days, that is the procession that Elizabeth or whoever the monarch was would have made. Um, Elizabeth also had access to the chapel through her royal closet, which had a sort of back passage almost um, to, her, to her royal closet. Um, she also had another royal closet, which was used for, for sort of ferial days um, where there was no procession and she just sort of scurried away and <laughs> She didn't scurry away, she walked in a stately way um, uh, to, to, to go and observe, um, you know, the, the daily devotion. Um, I hope that answers the question. Just a small plug that the lecture you just mentioned is still available on our YouTube channel for anyone that's in the room or listening online. You can watch it later. Oh, no, sorry, we'll go over there first. Hi, um, thanks for a wonderful uh, triptych on royal governance. Um, I was supposing it seemed to dance around all of the three talks, the sort of gender uh, and the gendered nature of the various sovereigns and their mechanics and sort of image making. And I wondered if you could perhaps all speak a little bit more about that and how gender informs and inflects uh, the progresses in the Chapel Royal, uh, respectively. Thank you. Um, yeah, so unlike James, there's not really much evidence that Henry and his queens took progresses separately, but we do know that they often progressed together. Um, one of the most obvious gendered aspects, I suppose, of um, progresses was uh, space um, and privacy. Um, a really, where this comes to the fore really is on the 1541 progress to York, obviously with the whole scandal of Catherine Howard and the affair um, and a lot of that was down to the way um, this sort of new informal uh, spaces where progress has created liminal space where the sort of usual usual gender roles didn't necessarily apply so it gave Catherine Howard that kind of space I suppose to perform um, acts in privacy where she would not usually have been afforded that privacy. So we see a lot of um, kind of the making of space and the gendering of space on progress uh, in Henry's reign, where those kind of 
liminal spaces are, are um, exploited or can be built upon um, just because the court isn't where the court usually functions. Um, as we heard earlier, you know, the court is trying to recreate the usual uh, chamber on the move. Um, so that's kind of one area where gender uh, plays into the progress. Um, unlike uh, Henry, as Keely mentioned, James, James's consort, Anna of Denmark, did make her own separate progresses. Um, uh, she was often with James, but she often made her own separate ones. And as part of my PhD, I'm going to be looking at how um, she chose different areas of the country to go. For example, she went to Bath and Bristol a lot to take the waters, whereas this isn't something that James ever did. It's not anywhere he ever went. Uh, the princes also made their own separate progresses. Um, separate from both their parents. Um, so I'm going to be looking at how um, Anne, Anna chose her progress destinations and whether there was a gendered, um, whether there was gender decisions behind that, if she wanted to go and see great ladies, um, which she did. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm going to be looking at. But there's definitely a gender theme running through progresses. Um, I'll try and be as brief as possible because there's a lot to talk about with gender in the Chapel Royal. Um, you know, probably enough for some kind of undergraduate dissertation or more if anyone is watching or here. Um, so Elizabeth as a woman in, in sort of in the actual Chapel Royal doesn't evoke her gender much. Um, and that's fairly sort of concordant with um, some prevailing theories of Elizabeth's gender in that it's a sort of it's the monarch as a, as, a, as a position is a masculine office and thus she kind of um, tries to inhibit those roles. However, she accepts the fact and she, she, you know, she doesn't deny that she is a woman and the um, sort of gendered allusions are frequently made more so in sermons. Um, so sort of allusions to Deborah as the mother of the church um, are made a lot. And there's some argument to be made that um, various sort of churchmen who begin to criticize Elizabeth, um, there's, a, there's a bit that I cut out of my paper um, where Anthony Rudd in 1560, 1596 um, says that Elizabeth in is, the, in is, is in the climacterial year of her life, which she interrupts and says the greatest clerks aren't the wisest men and leaves, um, as you would. There's a very sort of valid argument actually to be made for the fact that they wouldn't have done that to a father. Um, they also wouldn't have done it to a brother because, well, he was a child. Um, <laughs> But there's a very so there's a very sort of interesting dynamic there to how Elizabeth uses her gender in those interactions, um, and the fact that she can sort of storm off and that can be acceptable um, is a very very interesting avenue of exploration and one that I could talk about for much longer. These might all be really inane questions. I don't know. This isn't my field, so I'm just sort of like, cool. <laughs> um, this is for, for Joe. Um, so uh, thinking about the, uh, you're talking about the level of correspondence between James um, and um, Council. Um, how recognisable were the people carrying that correspondence? That, that correspondence, and how much advance preparation was made for them travelling? And is that um, an extension of progress of a real progress to have? Um, really good question. Um, progresses were um, responsible for the um, enlargement of post horse routes at this time. Um, by the early 17th century, um, they were quite extensive. Um, I think it went from a letter taking a week to get from Edinburgh to London to about two or three days um, because of the post horse routes. Um, so they would have, it would have been done in post stages. Uh, so there would have been horses ready to take it from one stage to the next. Um, and that was something that started early on, I think, in Elizabeth's reign, um, and then it just expanded by James's reign. It, the, the network was huge, um, but they would have been ready. They would have been primed for a progress and ready to go. Um, uh, yes, I hope that answers your question. Question for Keeley, if I may, and thank you all for great papers. 
a question about your broader description of uh, Henry and other early mod modern rulers uh, hiring the best rhetoricians, writers, builders, artists, sculptors, etc. Is there anything peculiarly early modern about this? Because I would have argued that Edward III, Richard II, Henry V did the same thing. Did the Tudors or anyone else put their own unique spin on it? Um, that is a really good question. Uh, I'm not necessarily the authority on <laughs> you know, Tudor image. Um, Kevin Sharp is obviously a very, very good resource for uh, that sort of thing. I, what I will say is I think Henry, was the first monarch to really utilize the level of public literacy that people had in sort of image reading. Um, so for example, today, just to use a sort of modern example, you know, when we scroll through Instagram, there's, we all have a sort of expectation of what we're seeing. We, we are socialized in a way that we can read the sort of cues in people's posts or whatever. So the early modern public would have had the same type of literacy for sort of Tudor portraiture. Um, but I think, yeah, yes and no is the long and short answer to your question. Uh, no, Henry was not the first monarch to uh, recognize that, you know, he could manipulate his image in this way. But I think he was the first monarch to really invest a lot of time and money in presenting himself as this Renaissance, you know, scholar, king, um, by surrounding himself with good rhetoricians like Thomas More, um, painters like Hans Holbein to really um, push his image because of course the king, people, people's only access to the king outside of the progress was coinage um, or indeed portraiture. So that's a good way to kind of get across the image that you're wanting um, outside of your sort of access to the king. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, all three of you. A, a really interesting um, series of papers. Um, just, just following on from that question, I, I kind of want to take it in the opposite direction chronologically, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, and Joe, I just wondered, um, again, I'm being slightly cheeky, it's maybe going slightly beyond the scope of your paper, but I just wonder whether you can give any idea at all of whether what James does in terms of progress is sets a precedent that is then followed by the later Stuarts or whether um, whether they do their own thing or, or whether this is a tradition that dies out, if you see what I mean. It's a really good question. Um, yeah, uh, James was, Charles the Second, Charles the First um, did lots of progressing, but his, uh, even in James's reign, um, entertainments were less public and they were starting to be brought into the court as masks. And this is something that Charles I um, carried on. So he was less visible than perhaps James was um, to the majority of, to the, to the general populace. Um, Charles the, James II uh, does lots of progressing, um, but not to the same extent as James I. And I would, I think I'd probably say that James I was the last great progressing Stuart. Um, Queen Anne later on uh, made a few progresses, but um, the tradition sort of display sort of came indoors after James and was um, Charles, Charles I was a masker um, rather than a progressor, but he did make them. Um, I really enjoyed that, as you can imagine. Um, it's a question for all of you, in fact. Um, you are, in your various ways, you're emphasizing progresses in the Chapel Royal as places of propaganda, performance, um, enhancing the image of the monarchy in a, in a very Kevin Sharp uh, or even JPD Cooper sort of way. But you've also hinted at problems with that, tensions where things go wrong. Um, so particularly in progress is you've both hinted at ways in which progresses can impose enormous financial burdens, can lead to the clearing away of human trash as well as piles of rubbish. And presumably that does create fear 
um, in the localities. And similarly with, with Oscar's Chapel Royal, clearly the Chapel Royal is not simply a place where Eucharistic kingship is sort of uncomplicatedly projected. It's a, it's a flashpoint of tension. So my question is simply, how do, you, how do you account for those tensions in your work? How do you see both sides of the balance sheet in terms of what historians of political culture have often constructed as, you know, automatically effective strategies of propaganda simply because they took place? Um, okay, I'll take this one first. So yeah, you raise a really good point and it's a question I think that we've been grappling with in the Henry VIII on Tour network as well. It's simply like, how do you measure the success of the progress? Um, you know, what was people's experiences? Do they find them disruptive? Do they find them helpful? Um, obviously, we, there's a lot we know about the progress. There's a lot that's scripted about a progress, but there's also a lot that's unscripted, especially with Henry. I mean, there's an example of, uh, I think um, Greg Walker uh, talks about um, how there's kind of these popular myths of Henry VIII kind of swanning into like towns or villages and unannounced. So, you know, you do have these kind of unpredictable elements of progresses. And indeed, like I said at the beginning of my paper, just because they were grand and, you know, big and expensive, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were effective um, because they were an ex extreme expense, not only for the localities, but also, you know, who, like you mentioned, had to go out and paint their houses and clear away everything, but also for the crown, who had to try and manage a government while the king was like jaunting off on hunting trips, which were politically effective, but ultimately a massive expense to try and manage the usual correspondence of, of, of government. And indeed, especially dealing with petitions like um, Laura discusses in some of her work. So it's kind of, again, like swings and roundabouts, I suppose, for Henry's progress is like there were goals for each and arguably you can say that he met them, but did the sort of downside of the progress outweigh whatever, you know, were the goals necessarily just Henry's goals and were, was he successful only in, in his sort of inner circle and personal ambitions or did the localities see the benefit? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to James, um, his politicization was a bit more um, overt just because he was a king of Scotland and he was quite an unknown quantity in England. Um, so his union project was something that he used pro uh, progresses to, um, to, to get out there. Um, so uh, for example, in 1617, when he went back to Scotland for the first time since 1603, he insisted on taking a the full contents of an Anglican chapel up to Scotland with him, which was in incredibly expensive. And the Scots, were not happy with this at all, understandably. Uh, he was trying to push his religious agenda onto Scotland. Um, so I think when studying James, it's actually easier to see the negatives in progressing and see how people would have seen them as negatives because his, object his objectives were much perhaps clearer from the outset. That was, that was a nice teeing up the Chapel Royal there, um, <laughs> because Elizabeth has similar struggles, um, and so we're talking about tensions, um, as I sort of mentioned with her leading Protestant churchmen, or many of them, um, were, were really quite upset by what Elizabeth was doing in her Chapel Royal. Um, but beyond that, um, because that's talked about sort of fairly, fairly heavily and fairly thoroughly, um, points of tension are quite difficult to identify properly within the Chapel Royal beyond religious disputes and debates and sort of, it's difficult to identify fractures in Elizabeth's image, partly because of the sort of the complete absence of, you know, there's not exactly a wealth of material um, surviving, unfortunately. Um, however, there are, I mentioned Richard Morris, um, the one Welshman that we can find in the Chapel Royal, um, who runs away as a Catholic um, to the continent with his colleague, Nicholas Morgan, and the fact that two Chapel Royal men um, and a third I've also found ran away, but he, he was a child and then in his sort of twenties um, went and became a Jesuit. The fact that three men of the sort of same generation of Elizabeth's chapel um, all left in a fairly public way shows that Elizabeth's authority wasn't complete by any means over her chapel, um, be it in a Protestant dimension or Catholic. Um, 
but it's never going to be complete in a Catholic way. But um, yeah, that that's they are they are the, the identifiable tensions. I'm sure there are more. Um, I was going to ask a very similar question to what John just asked in, in probably a more articulate way than I could have done, but I guess I'll push it a little bit further, um, which is, I think nowadays we do take for granted in this generation of scholars, especially that Kevin Sharp um, conceptualization of political culture in this period of a successful projection of monarchical image and sometimes even policy through all of the, the wonderful things he illustrates and progresses and, and things like the, the itinerant court, whether it's progressing or not, uh, uh, are key to that. I suppose I'm interested in, in how far we can argue that there could ever be a transmission of ideas the other way. You know, we're, we're, we're quite used to talking about publicity and of course a lot of the stuff um, you're illustrating in your paper, Joe, about the number of people turning out to see James is one key source for that. But I'm wondering how much uh, we can be convinced that the more kind of ordinary swathe of society could communicate ideas back or whether we should see the transmission of political culture and ideas as an entirely top-down um, movement. Um, yes, good question. Um, so these qualitative sources, as I said in my, um, in my paper, they're very, I mean, to get the audience reception of normal people into these things is obviously incredibly different because most the people that you'd be interested in finding out what they thought about it were illiterate and they left illiterate and they left nothing behind. Um, I'm, it's, it's really hard <laughs> to try and get to that. Um, but I think when qualitative ways, like I mentioned, um, are also not particularly useful. Of course, everybody is going to be out to see the brand new king. They were, um, they were intrigued and they were, it doesn't mean they were fully supportive just because they were there. Um, so like the, the quote that I said about the plain honest Scotsman, that just gives us an idea that people were there. It still gets us no deeper to what, um, so I think, I think you have to look at the end results of these monarchs' efforts. And as I said, James, James's subjects weren't particularly pleased with him by the end. So perhaps that says that they weren't as effective as he thought they were. Um, but yeah, that's really difficult. I'm going to pass this on now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose the for Henry's reign it is equally as difficult, to, especially when considering the progress. There is just nothing on um, beyond some sort of popular myths I mentioned earlier around how people viewed the progress and indeed how they influenced Henry. Um, we kind of, it's kind of taken as a given in the historiography that Henry was particularly influenceable, if that's the word. Um, he was easily influenced. Um, but I don't think necessarily by the general populace. I mean, we can take the Pilgrimage of Grace as a kind of example, although other various uprisings, but I'm just using that one because it's kind of, there was a, a progress almost as a direct result. Um, and we see Henry's entrance into York kind of mapping that Pilgrimage of Grace route. And in the end, I mean, none of the rebellions were arguably successful there was a, a lot of dissent in Henry's reign but nothing that ever changed his mind especially in terms to of you know Anne Boleyn who was incredibly unpopular um especially in the southeast which was you know arguably the entire reason Henry took progress to Bristol so we kind of do see examples of where if there were going to be any results from this kind of bottom-down approach um, they didn't necessarily get very far. That doesn't mean to, you know, that doesn't say that there weren't any examples, just there aren't any that are incredibly apparent yet, but I don't know, maybe I'll find something <laughs> later on in my research, but that's, that's the pipe dream of every academic, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, again, it's very difficult to talk about the Jaffa Royal. Um, though I, I suppose sort of thinking about it, um, one of the clearest points 
that you know that this clearly isn't that you know that, that, that there's there's more than room for um a counter voice um though not sort of projected with the same uh with the same sort of volume um is the fact that access to chapel access to the chapel royal was fairly limited um and the music heard there was fair it was incredibly limited um nowhere else in england did you could you hear polyphony like that unless you went to a cathedral on a particularly sumptuous holy day um and, and you know the french ambassador happened to be there as well um i think i think the fact that i, I, th I think there's a real sort of lean in musicology and in history to see the chapel royal as a good thing um something that sort of protected you know the polyphony of bird and talus and that's the reason that the anglican church has lovely music now um and i think it's quite hard to get away from that actually i think it's quite difficult to address the reason that parish churches uh p p parish church choirs really kind of began to dissolve um obviously puritanical puritanical and calvinist uh inputs were instrumental in that um but whether there's room for you know a popular voice of the fact that people were quite frankly fed up of all of these <laughs> of all of these parish choirs um is a is a valid question um and could could, could possibly value from you know more more research um i am not putting myself on either side of the fence <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no. Sorry. No, yeah, I've just remembered, and it's particularly pertinent considering your research area as well. Like um, petitioning the king is a very big way in which Henry's policy, well, maybe not policy is influenced, but there is an example of where um, two of his courtiers are um, executed as a direct result from petitioning the king. So that is one area of it's not my I've not looked much into it so you probably know more about this than me but <laughs> um that's one area as well where uh the kind of there's like a measurable in the impact of people not necessarily on policy but on a sort of access to the king and more general uh, areas of life <laughs> right that was a really tough question I apologize um and I think we don't know the answer to it yet that's the kind of key thing. Okay, um, unless anybody else has any questions, I think we might wrap up there for a 20 minute uh, tea and coffee break. I've been told to let you all know as well that the exhibition is still open upstairs for this next break. So if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, do just pop up there. Um, it remains to thank our speakers for three really great papers that I think fit together really well. So thank you again.